Hey everyone, yeah, welcome to Youngblood. Ah, boo hiss, boo hiss, ah, we all hate it. But there's actually an interesting story behind it, so stick around. You know, you may get some food for thought. Not saying you have to agree with this, but it's worth listening to. Anyway, it is safe to say that Wolfenstein Youngblood is a big departure from the traditional formula of the series. Don't worry, there's still plenty of Nazi killing, but apart from that, Youngblood is different from the traditional Wolfenstein game in almost every way. It's also safe to say that most people weren't super happy with the game. We weren't either, or at least I wasn't specifically. You can check out our review if you want more personal takes on it from us, but here, part of the issue is how much of a departure Youngblood is from the rest of the Wolfenstein series under Machine Games' development. Instead of a linear, story-driven, single-player game, Youngblood is designed to be played by two players in co-op mode. Sure, you can play by yourself with an AI buddy, but that's not really the ideal way to experience it. Sometimes it might be more ideal based on how the AI works, but again, that's review stuff. It's also more open world than the previous Wolfenstein games, and controversially, the game has microtransactions. Ah, oh, everybody loves them. Oh, those microtransactions they got. So they're just for cosmetic items, and reviewers have said they're not that intrusive, but it's still led to criticism of the game and its developer Machine Games for succumbing to the lure of the games of service models taking over everything. So how was Wolfenstein Youngblood developed? What's the story behind this drastic departure from a beloved franchise, and why did Machine Games betray everything good about the series just to make a quick video game buck? Okay, that last one is a pretty leading question, but that's how it looks on the outside. Aha! But this is inside gaming! Yeah, we'll, we'll never get over riffing off that. So to get some answers there, we sat down with Jörg Gustafsson, the executive producer at Machine Games, and Bethesda marketing head Pete Hines to talk about the game's development history and why they made the choices they did. And honestly, their answers were surprising. From the outside, the narrative seems super clear. Turn Wolfenstein into something that can just be a vehicle for garbage DLC and just trade away everything we love about the series in the process, you bastards. But there's another story here. It really is, you know, depending on how many grains of salt you want to take with it. And it all started with the decision to go co-op. Dear Gustafsson and Heinz tell it, the idea to implement co-op came out of a desire to try something new as a studio. And it is new, so there's that. Gustafsson admitted that the co-op idea would be a weird sell to Wolfenstein fans, but as a studio, they wanted to take risks and do something new and fresh. So we felt like this spin-off story that we wanted to do was a good opportunity to, to try to explore something new and try to broaden ourselves, basically. Uh, and become better game developers. And Heinz said that's a philosophy that extends throughout Bethesda. He also pointed to Fallout 76, again middling results, but it is an example of the studio wanting to try something that they'd never done before. In the case of 76, it was entirely born out of the studio saying we want to try something different, something we've never tried before. In the case of Wolfenstein Youngblood, Heinz said that at one point, he actually told Gustafsson that he wasn't sure they were going far enough in terms of stepping outside of their comfort zone. That's kind of interesting. Again, Heinz said the idea is to get experience making new things and to evolve as a studio so that you can make the next game even better. And as much as we might want more of the same, that may not be good for the developer or their longevity in game development. Why is that? Well, Heinz says that when you work with creative people, it's very hard for them to make the same game over and over again. They don't want to just do Elder Scrolls Fallout, Elder Scrolls Fallout for the rest of their lives or careers. Like that, that is enough for them. So from Heinz's perspective, a development staff needs to constantly try new things and develop new skills to continually improve and find satisfaction with their work. I gotta admit, I can empathize with that. Here we certainly, like, we crank out gameplay videos nonstop, and we're pretty good at it, and certainly the audience seems to like it pretty well, but at some point, we like to try biting off something new. Doesn't always mean it's gonna be a hit with the audience, but sometimes Sometimes we have to look out for ourselves too, just so we find the reason to keep coming back into the job and making dick jokes at old video games over and over again. So that it much makes sense to me. Oh, you guys can, can take with that in the comment section and do what you want with it. But from Heinz's perspective, he said that if you do that, if you take that risk and push people, you can end up with some badass games that seemingly come out of nowhere. Heinz pointed to another game as proof of what a studio can accomplish by trying something completely different. You don't get Horizon Zero Dawn without developers stepping out of their comfort zone and trying something that is wholly different from what they're they have been making and they're known for. Of course, Horizon was made by Guerrilla Games. That's a studio that was previously known for first-person military shooters like the Killzone series. But Horizon Zero Dawn, a post-apocalyptic sci-fi RPG, was a complete 180 from Killzone. It was an example of a studio taking a big risk, and it worked. Horizon Zero Dawn became a must-have exclusive for the PlayStation 4 and one of the breakout games of this entire generation. But we're talking about machine games here, and you know, it's not quite apples to apples there. But the studio did settle on the 
the idea of making a spin-off Wolfenstein game featuring the grown-up twin daughters of series protagonist B.J. Blazkowicz and his wife Anya. In the game, which is set 20 years after the events of the new Colossus, they're all grown up and have traveled to France to search for their missing dad, or as they keep saying in the game, daddy. It means something else now, but... We'll let it slide, they're Texas girls, I guess. The fact that it's a co-op game made it completely different, technically, gameplay-wise, everything, and a much bigger challenge to develop compared to a traditional Wolfenstein game. Just to use one example from Gustafsson, they had to figure out ways to gate the players so they wouldn't get too far away from each other. I mean, as far as the game's concerned, that's just a lot of doors that take two people to open, but yeah, you gotta find solutions to tricky problems. There's also enemy spawns to consider, as well as all the different ways players can approach combat. The fact that you're having to consider two players instead of only one makes gameplay design and balancing really, really challenging. Understandably, and accordingly, Gustafsson said that making Youngblood has been a new challenge for his studio. Now, if you compare that to a single-player game where the designer has much more control over where the player goes and what they see, this is a whole other ball of Nazi wax. They have been forced to think in a much more non-linear way, and not only when it comes to gameplay, but also storytelling. Gustafsson said that one of the goals in Youngblood is for players to spend much more time in the game, which seems similar to how Destiny and Borderlands games entice players to play the same sections over and over. He also said that the game's framework is built with the possibility of adding on additional content in the future. Yes, this is all starting to sound very games as service-y. And that doesn't necessarily need to be a bad thing, provided that the two fit together well, which is, again, a whole other thing. But Youngblood's design is definitely more in tune with that model than past Wolf and games. And while we, on you know, the, the gamer side of things might assume that the game is just cramming in games of service mechanics just to make some more money, that does kind of discount the developer side of it. Gustafsson doesn't see that model as necessarily being a bad thing as long as players are still getting a lot of value. And that's kind of the opportune word. It's value gaming content for your dollar. For one, he says the games of service model gives developers a chance to continually improve and add to a game. And I said that, of course, there's a responsibility to give player their money's worth from the beginning, but it's also the case that when when a game is shipped or released, it's in the worst shape it'll ever be. So it's a weird sentiment to try to incorporate, right? We like to think that games should be perfect when it launches, but such a thing doesn't really exist. Every developer has to kind of hit a crossroads of features and content for the time and money and developers that they have, and then eventually just say, okay, I guess this is 1.0, and then hopefully continue to build on it because theoretically that's what we want too. We want to spend more time in the games we like, but theoretically, if all those bugs get fixed, and meanwhile the developers keep offering free updates and new content, Gustafsson says that's a great value for players. So, eh, from that side, it doesn't sound so bad. He also described there's another scenario where players can benefit from this model. We also have games that are coming out. Uh, they suffer from some, some you know, issues and bugs, whatever it may be. And, and then you can buy that game you know, six months later, often to a discounted price, and they, it's a better experience, right? Uh, and that's where I think the game as service model actually can benefit both the, the developer and the consumers. Of course, the other wrinkle here is that this is the age of free-to-start games like Fortnite, where you could conceivably play for hundreds of hours and never spend a dime. Heinz says that's one of the biggest challenges in gaming today compared to even just 10 years ago, which makes it really hard for a traditional game like Wolfenstein to capture gamers' attention now. Heinz said that back in the early 2000s, if you released a game, your main competition was other games that were released in the same window. Nowadays, you might be competing with a game like Fortnite that's been out for years and just constantly keeps iterating and adding fresh content to keep players invested. Let's be honest, this is an era unlike any we've seen before. I've now been gaming for 40 plus years. And nowhere have I seen an era like this one where you can grow up as a gamer, get into games, enjoy games, and play them constantly and never spend a dime. And those free games, there, there are a lot of them. You got strategy card games to online games, first person shooters, there's a lot of them. They're all pretty good and they're all free. That's the environment in which games like Youngblood have to compete nowadays. Heinz called it a quote, pretty steep level of competition that previously just wasn't on anybody's radar. And I'm not, I'm not, inferring whether that is good or bad it doesn't really matter like that's the reality you better embrace it like you're you're competing for people's time in an era where they don't need to spend money to to participate in a hobby they love so we're kind of in this position now we'll see how a 30 dollars game like wolfenstein youngblood does and whether or not the audience will accept a radically different kind of game under the wolfenstein label win or lose here bethesda machine games are taking it as a learning experience and an opportunity to improve and that's something we can all get behind just theoretically personally speaking i want to see a world where wolfenstein games keep getting made i don't know if the previous games justify their cost uh, but it is really hard given the success of free-to-play games and games of service games 
to tell them to not experiment with that, uh, especially since it's their game and they get to creatively choose what they want to work on. Personally, I think a lot of people would rather have gotten behind a new, good Wolfenstein game, but that's kind of the definition of risk, right? Uh, you don't find new opportunities by playing it safe. You gotta roll the dice, and sometimes you get a Fallout 76, sometimes you get a Horizon Zero Dawn. And heck, who knows? Maybe there's a future where Wolfenstein Youngblood becomes a cooperative Wolfenstein experience that's worthy of the series. Maybe that's another game in the future. Hard to say. The benefit is that if it's a living service, there's a path where it can get there, as opposed to 10 years ago when it would just be that forever. The thing is though, there's no way to get to either of those outcomes, whether that's Youngblood being a really fun game someday, or another co-op game being amazing, without taking that first step. And that's what Youngblood is, or at least that's how I prefer to think about it, as a first step, an experiment onto something greater. You may choose not to think about it that way. I tend to try to look on the sunny side of things, especially since I'm such a huge Machine Games and Wolfenstein fan, but I certainly get people's disappointment with it too. Still, hopefully Bethesda and Machine Games can learn from it all, be constructive about it, and continue to make awesome games in the future. So hopefully that was good food for thought for you, maybe provide you a different perspective, or you can just light us up in the comments about how we're shilling for Bethesda again. I don't know. Uh, they fed me when I went to QuakeCon, so there you go. Crap Games Journalist at it again. Thank you for watching Inside Gaming. We'll catch you next time. Bye, everybody. It's not that I think it's a poorly made game, uh, but it's not the game that I wanted, which is Wolfenstein, but co-op. Uh, it's not that. It's yeah. more like a Destiny Division Far Cry type thing that uh, I did not expect and I didn't get any indication from when I watched any of the marketing stuff. So also a little disappointed, but that doesn't mean that nobody's going to like it. I don't think that that's the case here.